the legend behind the rainbow. Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 things Judy 2019 got factually right and wrong. For this list, we're looking at all the facts in the biographical drama Judy and seeing if they were true to the late Judy Garland's life. You won't forget me, will you? In a promise you won't. Number 10. Her marriage to Mickey Deans. True, Judy Garland's fifth and last husband was in fact Mickey Deans, an entrepreneur 12 years her junior. She and Deans were married only months before Garland died, which has over the years caused speculation about his involvement in her demise. Though the film ends before Garland's death, we do get to see her and Deans' marriage, as well as the cracks beginning to form in their relationship and those close to Garland mistrusting Deans. In real life, Judy's third husband, Sid Luft, accused Deans of causing Garland's death, although no proof of this was ever found. Deans did, however, hold auctions for some of Garland's possessions before he himself died in 2003. Deans told his interpretation of the story in a book he co-authored called Weep No More, My Lady. Number 9. How She Met Mickey Deans False In Weep No More, My Lady, Mickey Deans wrote about how he met Garland. There's a man under the trolley. What? Hey, baby. Surprise! The way he describes it, the two met in 1966 at Garland's Hotel in New York. Deans had been tasked with delivering stimulant tablets to her, arriving to what he described as a cordial but disoriented starlet. Because two of her children were there at the time, Deans decided to pretend he was a doctor delivering medication to avoid giving off the wrong impression. In the movie, however, the couple met in a much simpler way. Judy goes to meet her daughter Liza Minnelli at a party and encounters Deans, after which the two hit it off for the whole night. We can't have the world's greatest entertainer out here without a drink. Frank Sinatra's here? Frank is great, but he is no Judy Garland. Chug, chug, chug. Number 8. Rosalind Wilder. True. Judy? Have you seen Judy? In the movie, Judy has a production assistant who's been charged with caring for her, played by Jesse Buckley. This figure was not manufactured for the movie and was actually a real person named Rosalind Wilder. No, 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 no. What, what do you mean you can't? There's an audience out there waiting to hear you sing. My mouth dry and it could fall apart. Listen to me. Judy, I can't. Garland! You'll be fine. In current interviews, Wilder has described her time working with Garland and the trouble she faced in the months before her death. As she left me in the prompt corner and the lights hit her, she became the Judy Garland of legend, and that was what was magic. During her residency at the Talk of the Town Club in London, Wilder said that Garland was fragile and that she had even, quote, lost the ability to be her own person. Are you going to be all right? What if I can't do it again? Number seven, her attempted suicide. True, when speaking with a doctor in the movie, Garland mentions that she had previously attempted suicide. And this is factually true. You need to take better care of yourself, you understand? In fact, there are two known attempts that the performer made on her own life. The first took place in the late 1940s, around the same time that she suffered from a nervous breakdown while filming The Pirate. Don't you see what this could mean to my future? It could mean the ruination of my complete life! She was hospitalized multiple times in this period. Another attempt took place in 1950 when Garland cut her own neck, saying of the decision, quote, I wanted to black out the future as well as the past. I wanted to hurt myself and everyone who had hurt me. Do you take anything for depression? Four husbands. Didn't work. Number six, the audience sing-along. Possible. Over the rainbow. Way up high. One of the most moving moments in the film comes when Garland is attempting to perform her most well-known song over the rainbow in a club and falters, unable to continue singing. The audience takes up where she left off, singing the rest of the song for her, in a scene that is memorable and poignant. Though it's hard to totally disprove that something like this ever happened, there's no evidence pointing towards a particular moment when this took place. And they sang it, which is really El tearjerker of your dreams, <laughs> you know. We can definitely see why the filmmakers added it, though. Dreams that you dare to dream really do come true. Number five, she was booed off stage. True. In the movie, there is an upsetting scene where a British audience throws things at Garland when she shows up late to a performance. You're late. So what? You have to be home for your mommy to put you to bed. 
But did this really happen? Unfortunately, it did, and was reported in U.S. papers in January of 1969. The reports say that Garland was an hour and 20 minutes late for her own show, and that people in the crowd threw cigarette packages and food at her when she finally took the stage. They continued to boo her for three songs before an audience member actually got on stage and demanded she apologize, prompting her to simply leave the performance. Number 4. She was broke and basically homeless. True. The kids need a home, Judy. I know what kids need. They need their mother. During the time the movie is set, mostly in early 1969, while Garland was doing her Talk of the Town performances, Garland was not in a good place. Just a couple of years earlier, she owed half a million dollars in taxes to the IRS. I don't have a home. I can't even get a manager. London would offer you a lot of money. After a run of shows at the Palace Theater in New York City, federal tax agents arrived at her final performance to take most of the money she'd earned. Her daughter, Lorna Left, described her as being, quote, homeless broke during this time. At the beginning of Judy, we see Garland and her children ejected from a hotel. I'm very sorry, but your suite has been released. What do you mean, released? Where exactly is it gone? <laughs> Left without a home, Garland sets out to perform in London to make enough so she can buy a house for her and her kids. You're saying I have to leave my children if I want to make enough money to be with my children? I would very much like to stay. Number three, her dinner with a couple of super fans. False. Would, would you mind? Oh, of course. Though there are many dark moments in the film, there are some bright ones too. In one of the sweetest and most uplifting scenes, Judy meets two of her biggest fans after one of her sets and has a conversation with them that ends with her inviting the two of them to have dinner with her before they end up back at the couple's apartment. Do you... Do you wanna, um... get some dinner? I mean, if you're not doing anything? Sadly, this scene was fabricated just for the film. A premier communications publicist said, quote, In terms of the couple scene, this refers to relationships she built with regular fans and attendees of her shows. However, this specific scene is fictionalized. If it's trouble, I don't... No, 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 um, that we'll find somewhere, won't we? Of course. Of course. Right. Of course. okay, um, well. Lead on, my good gentleman. <laughs> Number two, her strict diet. True. From the time she signed to MGM Studios, Judy Garland had a complicated relationship with food because of diets the higher-ups forced her onto. In an interview, she said, quote, From the time I was 13, there was a constant struggle between MGM and me, whether or not to eat, how much to eat, what to eat. I remember this more vividly than anything else about my childhood. She would be a little heavy and fat and... Then she would get very thin and get a little gaunt, and we'd have to make some compensations about the way we would light her and uh, treat her. In the film, we get a glimpse into Garland's younger years. On a stage date with Mickey Rooney, a studio exec gives her a pill to help with her hunger, stating that they can't have Dorothy gaining weight mid-shoot. Ouch! What do you think you're doing? She's also refused cake at her own birthday, which is given a heartbreaking juxtaposition later in her life, showing that she never recovered from the early trauma of this treatment. Shout hallelujah, come on, get happy, get ready for the judgment day. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. MGM fed her pills. True. In Judy, we see a Judy Garland in her 40s, clearly suffering from addiction and sleep problems. Mama, please don't go to sleep now. No, 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 the other ones. It turns out that this was a lifelong battle. Starting before she even began working with MGM, she alleges that her mother gave her pills to help with her performance and that MGM continued the practice, offering her amphetamine so that she would be able to work for hours and then barbiturates to help her come down from the uppers. This aspect of her tragic upbringing was depicted in the film. Though others have refuted these claims over the years, it's a position Garland maintained until her death from an accidental overdose. They hound people in this world. Anybody who's different. They can't stand it. Well, to hell with them. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Ms. Mojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.